on non-Intel, non-X86 hardware. So here's a quick outline of the talk. I'll uh, give some motivation about why we uh, want this kind of stuff in the kernel and why we provide this as a service in user space, as a library in user space. I'll talk a little bit about the history of HWPMC to date and the uh, systems that it was available for. Uh, I'll explain how the driver works and how it gets <coughs> the data out of the kernel and how it traces uh, processes and how it traces the work that's going on. This is too loud. I think that's too quiet. All right. Is that better? That's not ringing. Okay, good. I'll uh, talk a little bit about how the thing actually works, and then I'll come to the main point of the presentation where I talk about what it, what's required to port HWPMC to port the device driver to work on new hardware. Um, so, uh, and then specifically, I'll talk about the work I did porting it to the MIPS 24K CPU. Um, a quick slide: what you will not learn in this talk, uh, you won't learn everything there is to know about performance analysis. Uh, you won't learn the math to do performance analysis, and I will not talk about specifically how to optimize your code. I'm really going to talk about the driver and how it works. Um, so why do we care about this kind of stuff? Um, I like putting this on my slides. Moore's law is dead. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but your processors are not getting any faster. You're going to get a lot more little processors, but they're not going to go any faster than they, they are now. Um, also, power consumption is now going to be the biggest enemy of your software because power is expensive and because <coughs> the faster you run your processor, the more power you're uh, consuming. Also, and this is a, a good lesson for people who live in Japan, uh, cooling isn't free. So if you live in a hot country, you will actually care about cooling your computers sufficiently to keep them running. Uh, and I like to think that fast code is better than slow code. So, what are the kinds of things we can optimize? Because this will tell us you know, what we would use something like this uh, subsystem for. You can optimize time and or space. For the most part, uh, the HWPMC driver will help you optimize time um, as opposed to space. Time can be measured in transactions per second, space in the amount of memory you use. Um, some of the things that people often do wrong in optimization. Um, so generally, a programmer will look at some piece of code and intuitively try to understand you know, in their head, oh, this piece must be the thing that's slowing the system down because this looks complex or it looks like it's order 2 to the n or order n squared. And um, especially on modern hardware, programmers are almost always wrong. So uh, if you're looking at a piece of code, just looking at it in your editor, and you think it's what's causing things to be slow, uh, you should really check. And that's another thing that this kind of code will help you with. Um, a lot of people also spend too much time optimizing. They'll look at a piece of code, and they want to get every little you know, instruction out of it. And so they sit there, and they optimize, and they optimize. And it's kind of like polishing a mirror. And so if anyone knows about making telescopes, you have to polish the mirrors. But you can actually polish forever. And so people will just spend all of their time trying to optimize one piece of code without making the entire system work. And the last peril of optimization is doing it too early. So often uh, when developing or designing a system, instead of getting a significant amount of the system in place, um, someone will say, you know, usually it's someone who wants to do something more interesting than building the whole system. Like, I want to make this piece of code run really fast. So these are things to be avoided in optimization. Um, so this is important because this is talk about where we can actually use these tools. Um, the way you optimize a piece of code, you design an experiment. You decide what you want to measure. Um, you know, if you're a manager, you just say that I want the code to go fast, but that's not very helpful. Um, you choose a workload. You perform the measurement. Um, this is where you would use something like the HWPMC tools. You form an idea about what to change, you make the change, and then you take the same measurement again, and you evaluate your result. And HWPMC is done, is used to take these measurements, to measure your code's performance on some uh, known quantity. So now this comes to some of the motivation for why we have HWPMC. So how you record a measurement, what tools you use to measure the performance of your code, 
um, can bias the test, and this is what's called a probe effect. And this comes from actual electrical probes. If you take an oscilloscope and you have a, a board and you take a wire probe and you stick it on a trace on the board, you're going to affect the performance of the board, of an actual piece of hardware. It's an electrical engineering, electrical engineering term. Um, and this is true for any tool you're going to apply to software. And I'll talk about this in terms of some of the tools people have used in the past. Um, so what you really want is you want a recording framework or a driver or a tool or something that has as low an impact on your actual program as possible. What you don't want to have is when you record your results, you find out that half of the time um, spent measuring the system was spent in actually measuring the system as opposed to running the system. You want the amount of time spent measuring the system to be a very small percentage of the amount of runtime of your code. And you'd like this stuff to be easy to store and replay and explain. I would say at the moment that the thing we in the open source world have the most trouble with is explain. Um, usable graphical tools for showing performance analysis to people who are not programmers are not very common. Probably the best right now is something called Shark that runs on the uh, Apple uh, OS X, Mac OS X. Uh, it's probably the nicest looking one. So, how did people study the performance of systems, in particular on Unix, for about 20 years? So there's a tool written in the 1980s called GProf, and GProf has a special compiler option, and what it does is it inserts code into your executable program, and then when your program runs, the kernel is actually collecting statistics on what your program is doing at any particular time. Um, this is where you see things in uh, the FreeBSD kernel like stat clock and stat hertz. That's in there so that when you're running a program under GProf, um, that we can collect statistics in the kernel about what your program is doing and then report them later. The problem is that GProf has a demonstrable, actually quite a large probe effect. So if you take a program and it takes five minutes of CPU time to run um, without this option, when you run it under GProf, it will take much longer. And so you will actually often miss extremely important events or you'll miss things that you could optimize and you will not get a very good idea of where you need to optimize your code. It works well enough in the first one or two iterations where generally when you're trying to optimize a piece of code, you run it for the first time under GProf, if you're very lucky, you'll find one or two functions that are responsible for 70% you know, of the runtime. And those functions will be things that you can fix. And that they are order, order two to the n or order n squared, and you can optimize those. But very quickly, you run out of usable optimizations. The other problem with GProf is it really only measures one thing, which is it measures CPU time um, for functions. So you get a list of functions, and then you get you know, this function took 80% of the, of the CPU time, or 70% or 60%, and then its children took some, some amount. But it's not measuring anything other than that. So it's a relatively narrow tool, and it will bias the output, which we don't want to have. So is it possible for the processor to help us with this? So what if we had some on-chip registers that, um, made it possible for the chip to actually record what was going on. So, you know, every time an instruction is retired, which means every time the instruction is actually executed, maybe we could count that. Or every time we missed, uh, when we went to access the level two cache, we could record that, and so on and so forth. And so in early, um, well, not early, but in, in Pentium chips and in AMD K7 and K8 chips, um, both AMD and Intel started to provide these on-chip counters. Uh, and the nice thing about these being on-chip counters is that they have a much lower probe effect. They're not in software, they're in hardware, and they're being recorded, they can be recorded for you uh, with a much lower overhead. So the other reason to do this, of course, is that the CPU actually has the most knowledge of what's going on in the system. The CPU is <laughs> connected into the memory, it's connected into the, the bus, 
and it knows about things like floating point instructions. So if you've got a piece of code that's mathematically uh, complex, then you might find out that you're uh, really hammering your floating point ins um, instructions. These are all kinds of things that you might want to know, and these can be built into the CPU. So this uh, system we call HWPMC, which is a device driver and a set of programs, um, has been part of uh, CPUs since Pentium and the AMD K processors, as I, as I uh, mentioned. And of course, as the number of resistors on the die, the number of transistors, not resistors, <laughs> the number of transistors on the die has increased, you could count more things. There are more things you could count there. Um, so the newer the processor, the more things it can, uh, it can track. Now, embedded processors, which is what I'm going to talk about today, because I'm going to talk about a MIPS processor, um, have lagged in this area because they, you know, they need to be lower power. They need to have less transistors. Usually, they're made up of a set of cooperating um, functions, as opposed to, you know, in a Pentium. Every time a new generation of an Intel or an AMD processor comes out, they just throw more stuff onto a single die, and they just make the die larger and larger. Um, and they also then expend a tremendous amount of heat. So your average modern you know, Nehalem or Penryn chip is throwing off 130 watts. Um, you would not want, for instance, this to be throwing off 130 watts in your pocket. It would be, you'd have a very warm pocket. And so one of the ways that you reduce power consumption and one of the reasons that you don't get a lot of these features on embedded processors is because embedded is focused on low power, you know, and low heat. But they're beginning to catch up, and they're beginning to add some more of this stuff. So there are, are two basic components to any chip and to any system that's running under HWPMC, and these are events and counters. So counters are the number of things you can count independently. So they're the number of registers into which you can increase by one every time an event happens. Events are the types of things you can count. So instructions retired, uh, branch misses, cache misses, jump returns. It depends on the chip what they're going to count. Um, the fun part of this is that all of this is extremely specific to each processor and processor family. So for instance, um, if you're looking at uh, the MIPS family, which is what I'm talking about today, <coughs> the MIPS 24K is different from a MIPS 34K, is MIP different from a MIPS 100K, is different from et cetera, et cetera. You need the data book for every single chip to adapt the driver to them. So that's kind of uh, problematic. So how does the driver actually work in theory? Um, all these counters are kept on the chip uh, at the user level, which actually goes through a library. The user selects what type of counter to use and what event they want to count. Um, this then talks to the kernel driver, which programs the chip to start counting events. Uh, at some point, the chip may generate an interrupt so that you can pull things out, or you know, the program may just read the counter out. Um, HWPMC driver reads out the counters or logs logs entries into a kernel buffer. The user level library libwpm libpmc um, you know handles all the access to the driver, and then there's a couple of user level programs used to talk to the driver. PMC stat is the one that almost everyone's going to use to run a program that's being measured using HWPMC. Um, so a little more terminology. Uh, in HWPMC, there are, there's actually a matrix of how things are counted. Um, events can be counted in process mode only. So that means that once your process enters the kernel, there are no more events law, you know, credited to your process. So if your process is running along and you're counting the number of instructions it's using and you're counting and you're counting, and then the process blocks for some reason or you know, executes a system call and goes into the kernel, then if you're only counting process mode, you're not going to, to count any of the work done in the kernel. Um, and that can be done by any user on FreeBSD. That's not a privileged operation. Privileged, op privileged operation is counting things in the kernel. So these are called system mode counters. 
So you can count not only what your process is doing in, in user space, but once you transition into the kernel, you can count things in the kernel. Um, system mode counters are also used quite often by kernel developers to find out what the kernel is actually doing, because that's pretty important for us optimizing the kernel. And then there are two different modes for each of these types. So process and system mode counters, I should just use the laser. Process and system mode counters can either be recorded in counting mode, which just means, tell me how many of these events, say, every five seconds. There were, you know, four billion instructions retired, then there were three billion instructions retired in the next group, and then and we just count. Um, and that's really good for getting a, an idea of, you know, how a program is operating at a very high level. Um, and then when you want to get more specific about what a function is doing, like if you want to find out the function that is retiring the most instructions, which is much like GProf, or you want to find out the function that's trashing the level two cache the most often, then you would use sampling. And sampling is a way of finding out, you know, basically when the, when these events roll over, when we get a certain number of events, the kernel will say, oh, well, you know, show me like an n-level stack trace of what was going on when this event happened. We can statistically collect how, um, how the functions are, are acting within your program, and this is what gives you the GProf-like system of saying, oh, this function, this one is trashing the cache, or this function, this is doing something else. So process mode, system mode, either of these can be either in counting or sampling. And it's important to remember because you want to be recording the right thing when you're, when you're using this. So where are some example counters? These are examples from the stuff I just did on MIPS. Um, you can count just pure cycles. So, if, and why would you count cycles? I mean, you know what your, your cycles look like. But one of the things that people want to look at when they're doing performance analysis is, for instance, how many instructions per cycle or how many cycles per instruction. So it's very common to count two things at once, usually cycles and something else and then come up with a ratio to understand the performance. Um, and so here's an example of some stuff. So cycles, instructions executed, branch completed, branch mispredicted. Um, on modern processors, branch mispredictions are extremely, um, are much more expensive than other operations. So if you've got code that's misoptimized, so you've turned on dash 03 on uh, GCC, and sometimes dash 03 on GCC will will claim that it's optimizing your code, but you would really want to know that, you'd want to check. If you have a large number of mispredicted branches, you're actually not getting the performance you want, you're paying a penalty. Because every time there's a mispredicted branch, you wind up flushing your uh, instruction uh, pipeline. And every time you flush the instruction pipeline, you take a massive time hit, relatively speaking. So you really care about this. Again, uh, how often you're accessing the, the layer 2 cache, how often you're missing the layer 2 cache. On a MIPS 24K processor, there are 100 of these possible events um, that you can count. And on something like a Nehalem, or a, on a Nehalem, there are 227, uh, I've counted, uh, possible events, although many of them are sub-events. So you can say, you know, tell me about all of these, you can say, tell me about a certain subject section. So there's a lot of these possible events. Um, and there's a great quote when I was porting this and I was reading the, the MIPS manual. There's a great quote in the manual which says, you know, here is the list of all possible things you can count. And then it says, but you really need to understand what they mean before you count them or you're going to make a mistake. And really you should just use a smaller number. So the ones at the top are, are the ones to start with. Don't start with something esoteric. Um, the other nice thing in the HWPMC system itself, so if I go back to this previous page, um, I didn't show the names of these in other processors, but these are extremely specific to MIPS 24K, because they, what we've done is we make them, we, we make the names directly out of the manual, so that if you pick up the MIPS 24K manual and you look for this name, and even the, you know, some of the more esoteric names, you can find it in the manual. The problem is 
every single manual changes the names. <laughs> even, <laughs> even instruction executed has, you know, in some processes it's called instructions retired, in some it's called instructions executed, in some it's called instructions. And so this means that for every single chip you have a hundred new names, or if they're not, I mean, a human being could understand looking at them, oh, this must be the same thing, but the textual names are not the same. So for the most common ones, um, we provide aliases. So if you ask for instructions, lowercase, and aliases are lowercase, whereas the names from the manuals are uppercase, to, to tell them apart. If you ask for instructions on pretty much every chip that, in, that has HWPMC, it will figure out what the right low-level version is, right low-level name is, and count instructions for you, because that's just <clears throat> a much smarter way to do it. And it's a lot less aggravating for people who are using it. And so there are instructions, branches, branch misprotects. There's um, about 10 of these. Uh, yeah, of course, all the caching stuff really matters. And so the aliases make it easier to move between processors. So if you've written some scripts, so I've been writing scripts using uh, the HWPMC uh, libraries. I've been writing scripts to run uh, long programs for you know many hours and measure them completely. Uh, it would be nice if, for instance, I go from one you know a MIPS 24K to a MIPS 34K. If I don't have to go through and have a version of the script that knows what my processor is, and so that's why we have these aliases. Um, there's only a couple of programs you'll use. Uh, PMC control, you mostly use to find out if PMC is there and if it's working. Um, you don't use it for much else. PMC stat is what people use uh, pretty much all the time for collecting data about the program that's running. And I'm not going to talk too much about these because this is not actually a tutorial on HTTP PMC. It's, we're going to talk about internals. Um, but this will tell you, this is probably the the thing you really care about, the list of all supported, actually not counters, events is the dash L, dash capital L. So if you want to find out what all the possible things are, you can find that out with PMC control. Um, PMC stats, what you use to measure the program. So you run PMC stat and then you give it a command line under, under it and it runs that program under the system. Uh, has many possible arguments. <clears throat> and I would suggest reading the manual page. So let's talk about porting this. I mean, one of the reasons that I wanted to write this presentation and give this talk was to try and get people to, um, you know, who were working on different machines now that embedded systems are incredibly cheap, uh, to start porting this library to various different processors. It's actually a really important library for people to have because it allows us to actually have the fastest system if we can if we can get this stuff correct. Um, so. There's a five sort of high level things. You need to get the manual and then add all the events for all the processors actually reside in a single file. So that's kind of nice. Um, and you can find them and I'll show those in a second. Then there's a bunch of methods I'll talk about. You know, the HWPMC subsystem, like many subsystems in FreeBSD, um, does the, provides basically C-level objects, so you write a bunch of methods in C and you plug them into a structure and then you plug that structure into the kernel and then that's how everything works. So you just need to get the right methods in place. You make some modifications to the library so that it knows about your new chip. Here's a really important step. Document the counters. It is, it is extremely frustrating to read processor manuals, even for those of us who like doing it. Um, one of the really nice things about the PMC subsystem is that from the very beginning, when uh, was, there's a developer in India, Joseph Koshi, who wrote this system originally, and he was extremely meticulous in documenting every single counter, what it meant, how it worked, and you know how how it should be used. And you'll find the documentation in, in the system and also in, in the library. And so please keep up that tradition of doing good documentation on this. And then, and then you have to test it, it turns out. <laughs> so there's, um, in terms of code organization, there's two places where you'll find all the code. There's the kernel driver, right? This is source, this is the HWPMC. This is the driver source code. I'll show more of this. 
and then there is the PMC libraries. The documentation comes with the library, so that's where the new documentation files go. Um, and it's relatively simple to find this stuff in the tree. Okay, so this is a subset of the drivers, and this is how, I want to talk about how this is organized. So, um, here's the first file you're always going to have to modify, PMC events.h. This is where you put all of your new events. Um, and then you'll see here, this is a subset of the files in the directory. So for instance, um, note that there's two MIPS files. So there's a generic file for all MIPS, like any, any possible MIPS forevermore um, will be called at some level from this file. And this file is very short. Uh, it's basically some wrapper code that figures out, you know, which processor are you really look, using by looking up some sort of CPU type? And says, oh, you're on a MIPS 24K, jump that way and, and build the system up. Um, the more specific code goes in things like MIPS 24K.C. This is stuff specifically for this chip. Um, same sort of relationship between Xscale and ARM. And uh, the person who did the Xscale code is sitting in the room, but I won't identify him. Um, but they did a very nice job. I actually stole most of his ideas. Um, so what do we put into these files? So they're the driver is broken up into a machine dependent and machine independent code. Um, I spelled initialization wrong, I just noticed. Uh, HWPMC is fully you know, SMP compatible. It knows about the fact that there may be more than one CPU. So there's per CPU initialization, per CPU teardown. Um, these are what you use uh, for sampling in, in uh, sampling mode. So when we context switch in, we need to know that the process has been context switched in, right? So that we know that, oh, now you know, do we need to start counting these? and then switch out, and then the interrupt. And I'll actually show some of these functions, but not all. Um, and these are, the, these are the really low level functions you're gonna get. Um, one of the important distinctions in uh, HWPMC, and I should have ordered this table slightly differently. So, because you may or may not be counting events at any one point, you can allocate a PMC, which means that no one else can, can allocate that. Like if, if the system has, in MIPS, we have only two available registers to count into. So you can allocate the, the register, but not be counting. You can say, oh, okay, I'm waiting for this, and then you know, when we switch into that program, I'll start the counter. When we switch out of that program, I might stop the counter. Or you know, there are different libraries that do different things, like the system that um, Brooks talked about PAPI that he talked about in his high performance computing talk. That library specifically allocates a counter, but only starts counting when you make a call and then stops counting when you make another call. And that's used for very fine grain uh, work in uh, PAPI. So you need both an allocate and release set, which means I'm, I want this counter, don't give it to anyone else. And you also need a start and a stop. So the, the way that the code actually works is it, it will say allocate, start, stop, probably read, read, the, read the counter to get some data out of it. Um, you know, start, stop, read, start, stop, read, et cetera. And then when the program like PMC stat or some other program is done and it exits, it will release the PMC for use by other people. So. These are the, these two slides, these are the things you need to implement in order to port HWPMC to a new architecture. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about what the MIPS 24K chip is. Um, the reason I did this particular chip is because there's a board, I don't know if anyone's got one here, but there's a board called the Router Station Pro, which is an incredibly cheap MIPS development board. It's, a, it's got a four port ethernet switch on it, it's $89 US, which is, you know, cheaper than a good meal in Tokyo. Um, they're really cheap. It uses a release to MIPS 32 processor, uh, so it's a 32-bit MIPS, not a 64-bit. 
Um, it's got integrated instruction and data caches. It has a floating point unit, and then it has a coprocessor interface. And all MIPS chips have this coprocessor interface, and this is something I wanted to talk about because this is a, one of the ways in which this chip is significantly different from, for instance, an Intel chip. So let's talk about coprocessors. So MIPS, when you look at a MIPS manual, or you look at the MIPS architecture, MIPS really only defines the core. It defines the instruction set, and it defines uh, the layout of some very basic registers. Uh, back when MIPS and Spark and all of these things, uh, all of the early uh, RISC chips were developed, first of all, chip real estate was far more expensive. And most higher level functions, if you think of like the floating point unit, were not on the core CPU. So when MIPS and ARM and other people designed their cores, they literally designed only the core. And then they designed a way to add more functionality. And over time, this is you know all this coprocessor stuff. Now, <clears throat> almost anything that you're used to using in a modern processor, floating point unit, these counters, um, a lot of uh, caching, not all, well, some of the caching, is handled through the, what's called the coprocessor interface, and that includes performance counters. Um, this is completely unlike an x86 processor. In an x86 processor, you don't have to think about the fact that you have to go through a special coprocessor interface to access a special function. And so there's a set of, registered called, set of registers called the coprocessor registers, and you read an index off the coprocessor register to get to your special function. Uh, performance counters are always off of uh, index 25 on MIPS. So what does the MIPS 24K actually uh, provide us in terms of performance counters? There's two counters and two control registers, and they're tied to each other. So um, performance counter zero is just a 32-bit wide counter, and it can count up to 32 bits. And then it is tagged with, it is paired with a, a control register that has um, bits for things like what event am I counting? Is the event counted in system mode, exception mode, user mode, and one other mode? No, just three modes. E, S, and, e, S, and U. Um, user, user supervisor and exception. Um, so each so performance counter zero, there's a counter and there's a control register. Um, there's about 100 events, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the interesting things about the MIPS 24K specifically, and, and, and that branch of the MIPS family, which I have discovered is not the same as other branches of the MIPS, MIPS family, is that most events in the system, on the processor, can only be counted in either performance counter zero or performance counter one, but not both. And and they're actually locked to a particular counter. So I'll, I'll explain this by showing you the code in a, uh, in a moment. So the way to think of most of the events in, on this processor is in pairs. So for instance, um, I said earlier that many me measurements are taken as ratios, instructions per cycle or cycles per instruction, um, branches completed compared to branches mispredicted. So this is one of this. This is one of the sets that comes in pairs. And so, how many branches did I complete, and then how many branches did I mispredict? And these have to be locked into one or the other counter. All right. So, what does it look like when we add this kind of stuff to the file? I'm, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, and I realize that those in the back will. If you're wearing glasses, this is your eye test for the year. Um, so one of the nice things in the HWPMC driver and in the library in general, it's actually a really nicely written piece of code, the system in general. And so there are very convenient aliases, uh, macros, for just setting all this stuff up. And if you get the macros right, it all, quote, just works, unquote. Um, probably the two most tedious things, well, the one most tedious thing you will do is go through the manual extract all of these names, and then put them into a macro. And so there's this massive macro here. So, you know, MIPS 24K, and these are the events, cycles, instructions executed, branches, et cetera, et cetera. 
And these come right out of the manual. So here's what I was talking about, though, in terms of uh, counters have to be in, events have to be in counter zero or counter one. So for instance, and you see we've got these two, these three uh, macros here. Some events can actually be in either zero or one. And the obvious ones for this are cycles and instructions ex executed. Since you're going to want to measure many things in the system against cycles or against the number of instructions. So for instance, you might want to know how many branch mispredictions that I have per the number of instructions I just executed. That's a really important thing to know, to know if I'm missing, you know, if my branch, branch mispredictions are a lot of my instruction flow. That, that's expensive, we don't want that. So these, these two, cycles and instructions executed, can be counted in either a zero or one. Uh, this number at the right-hand side is actually the number from the manual which says, you know, what is this event number? So the problem here is that for many of these, it's the same, and we had to differentiate them. So there's a, you know, counter zero, counter one. So if you look at some of these, let's take a look at the first few, you'll notice how they were set up in pairs. Access and miss, access and miss, access and miss. We want to know the ratio of the number of times we accessed the instruction cache to the number of times we actually missed it when we went to go get an instruction. And so the way they make these counters usable is that, okay, well, I've got two registers in which I can count these events, and then you know I just put if I want to measure instruction TLB access versus miss, I can do those two. Now I can't, for instance, measure instruction misses versus data misses, because those would both try to go into counter one, they would collide, and the driver will tell you, oh, I'm sorry, so you know, what, what actually happens in the driver is we allocate the first one, we would allocate the instruction one, and then the next allocate would come along and we'd get E invalid, it's full, you can't have this one. So you have to be very careful on this architecture which things you try to measure. Now, of course, the driver is smart enough to not let you do this. It will return E invalid and, and PMC staff will say, I'm sorry, you can't do that. But it's something you need to know if you're gonna use any of the MIPS architectures, any of this branch of the MIPS family. And you have to, one of the other things you have to provide when you when you uh, port the driver is the aliases. At the moment, I've just got these three in here. Branches, mispredicts, and instructions. Um, I have not put in the cache stuff yet, although I will. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the internals of the code and what you need to do to, to make this work. Um, this is how we actually initialize the subsystem. This is called when HWPMC is loaded. This is not when PMC stat runs, this is when the driver is loaded into the kernel. Um, you notice we have a nice little triple X comment. Um, another interesting problem with MIPS is if you read books about MIPS, they tell you that there's a way that you can have more than two counters in the system. I've yet to find a system that actually has them or allows you to do that. So although you can supposedly issue an instruction to ask, we just know that the number is two and we set it, we set it ourselves. Um, we allocate our per CPE structure, we allocate the class structure, and then we do the usual trick in any BSD kernel, which is here's a generic structure, now I'm gonna fill it up with uh, function pointers, right? So this is how people do objects who don't do C++ in the kernel. So all of these functions get filled in. And you can see there's an allocate and a config and init, describe, get config, read, release, start, stop. Um, and then these are the class-based ones, and these are the machine-dependent based ones. Switch in, switch out, interrupt. Um, fix for 64-bit MIPS. This will not get fixed because this code's not going to be generic enough for both of them, so that's actually going to remain 32. And I just started porting this to a 64-bit platform, and I just put 64 in there. Uh, but it has to know, this indicates how wide the register is. Uh, and this is how many, how many PMCs you provide, this is the capabilities, uh, and then this is the class name. So we try to come up with short but descriptive class names. Please, if you're reporting this, I really want you to port this, 
don't make really long names. They're very hard to read. Um, so I talked about how the counters are actually allocated and the fact that you know, certain events can only be in counter zero or counter one. Well, how do we do, do that? Um, in the allocation routine, we had this, uh, where are we? The event codes that we, we had that I showed you earlier that had the all or one or two actually have the code, that's the event, and then the counter it's allowed to be in, right? So we get both of these out, um, we check to make sure we haven't gone past the end of the table, um, and we say, well, if the counter is all, then it's fine, right? Do, do the uh, Boolean math the other way. And when we enter this function, we actually get a, an argument called ri, which means row index. So if you have two counters available, in which to, you know, to count events, then that row index can either be zero or one. And so you're checking against the row index. So, and this is where we return you in val. Um, this set of code is how we, um, is how we decide where, when we're going to count. So if the capabilities that came into this call are, you know, count system events, then we actually count both super and kernel. So in the in the MIPS, you don't just have user or user or super super user. Um, you actually have three levels, which is kernel, super, and user. So you know, if either of them, then we just do both, and then we configure the event. This does not start it running. This just allocates the event. Happily, the, the starting it is really easy. Um, under this macro is a little bit of assembly language that uh, writes, you, you need, so one of the other interesting things in a risk chip is there are some instructions that are going to force all of your pipelines to flush. Um, they basically are barrier instructions. And one of those instructions on the MIPS is anything to do with the coprocessor. Because if you didn't do that, and I, I say this in the paper as well, if you didn't flush all of your um, pipelines, then something that happens on the coprocessor and something that happens on the main processor might collide. So this little bit of assembly language that's under this macro uh, writes to the coprocessor interface, and that instruction, move to coprocessor zero, um, will flush all that stuff out. And then it simply takes this uh, value, the config is the event, and writes it into the register, and off you go, you're running. And that depends on which row index. So another interesting, another uh, issue with the MIPS chip is that you have to specifically give it a different offset for counter zero and counter one, which actually show up, unfortunately, as counter zero and counter two. Uh, I'm going to use the whiteboard, which means I'm going to screw up the poor cameraman. Go on the side. I'll keep this out of the screen. So the way, so this is actually organized in a set of registers, right? So you've got what you've really got is you know a control register and another control register, and this is two, and this is zero, and this is the the counter zero, and this is counter one. It would have been nice if I could have had a single macro that said, you know, given this, do either one. But since I actually had to parameterize it such that it could do a, an offset, um, there's a little cheat in MIPS in their coprocessor interface. Um, some, so if you've got the coprocessor interface, which is CP0, that's what they call it, CP0. And CP0 has an offset of 1 to, I forget what the maximum number is, but 25 happens to be where the performance counters are. And certain of the coprocessor interfaces are special. And special means that they're, they're an exception. So in order to get to this, you have to use an instruction, move to coprocessor 0, 25, and then you've got to give it an offset zero. And so that's why this code 
is a little silly, but it does work. And these are the kind of, you know, it took me a little while to figure this out because you read one reference and it says one thing, and you read another reference and it says another thing, and <coughs> you don't know until you try it. So these had to be added later. But this is all that you need to, once you write this configuration into the control register, you're counting. Events will be incremented in this, uh, in the register until you clear the register out. Uh, clearing the register out is really simple. You write zero to it. Since the data is actually accumulated here, zeroing this out zeroes everything. So um, you could optimize, although I didn't bother. And since the control register has several fields, I could just flip a single bit. But there was really no point. It's cheap to write a zero, it turns out. And so I just did that to turn off turn off counting, and then I just rewrite the whole register next time. Oh, okay, good. I almost have time. Um, <laughs> so there are some manual pages that you can look at to, you know, look at how this stuff works. Um, the Driver manual page is really useful mostly for tuning the driver. Um, the original version was written for much smaller memory, much slower machines, and so the number of samples and things that it records is still fairly small. And on a modern processor, you really want to increase, you really want to change the tuning values so that you're capturing more data. Uh, one of the first things you'll find if you run this on something like a, a fast Penran or, or even a fast MIPS is that if you start sampling data, uh, when you exit, the program will say, oh, I missed a whole bunch of data that you could have had because your sampling buffer was too small. So you want to take a look at the tuning uh, information and, and make the sampling buffer larger. I mentioned the control program, the statistics program. There's a new program called PMC Annotate, which is quite cool. Um, it does a lot of what PMC stat with, G, with uh, GProf output did, but it does it better. Um, you can actually add calls from the HWPMC library directly to programs if you want to measure things within your program. That's a, a little tedious, and I've yet to do that. Instead, I use this thing called PAPI, which we've talked about. So this is my uh, pitch to get you to try this code and to you know, pitch in and, and help with this. Um, so adding support for new processors is fun. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Uh, well, that's CPU awesome. I used to have hair. Um, <laughs> so uh, support for more MIPS is on the way. Uh, Xscale is already in the tree. Um, there's a lot of embedded chips, you know, and, and and I've done embedded systems for a long time. I think they're they're really a lot more fun than desktop systems. First of all, they're smaller and quieter, um, and these things are not really cheap. I mean, when I started doing embedded work, I will not tell you how many years ago. The machine next to my desk was five thousand dollars, right? And now I can have one of these things for eighty-nine bucks, uh, or an Octane for thirty-three dollars. Octane too. Although I, getting it home would be hard. Um, but there is more of this on the way. I'm looking at two new MIPS ports, and I know that people are looking at more PowerPC stuff. So if you want to learn more about how to do this, this is if you're working on MIPS, this is a great book. Um, C MIPS run. Second edition. Ignore the fact that it says Linux on it. There's like a little Linux chapter he had to throw in, and I'm willing to forgive him for that. Um, but the book is is excellent. It's one of the best written books about a processor that I've ever read. That I've read more than one is probably unpleasant. But uh, Dominic Sweetman, and then you know the MIPS 32 architecture um, volume one is where you'll find this stuff. And then if you're using these tools, I really strongly recommend this book. If you're actually trying to measure code and build experiments to do performance analysis, please read this. This is called The Art of Computer Systems Performance Analysis by Raj Jain. Um, it's a really good book for, you know, I mean, we're all systems like people. We, we do OS work and, and systems like work. And it will make your life much easier. You don't want to get a degree in statistics to understand what your program is doing. So this is a great book. All right, we have 10 minutes for questions. I think we'll have nine minutes more than we need. Any questions? <laughs>
Uh, well, I, I would just, just from your talk about the MIPS and the allocating these counters, it sounds like only really one process can be doing this performance monitoring at a time. Um, well, you could do system level. Right, if you do system level, you'll get events for whatever process is swapped kind of the, is swapped. Yeah, yeah I mean, if, if I'm, I'm doing this for my one program, mm -hmm. and you're doing it on the same processor, we probably won't have a good time. Yeah, you won't be able to do that. And even something like an Ahalem only has three, it has seven counters of which one is the TSC, because it's six counters of which one is the TSC. Usually you're doing this just as one person. Um, you you probably are not going to have multiple users doing this at the same time. And certainly, yeah, not on this one. Yes? How does it play with uh, SMP? Does it, I mean, if your code gets moved to a different processor, do the counters follow it? Okay. Yeah, so, well, of course, on this one, it's not going to matter because this isn't an it's SMP processor. But on, um, yes, the reason there's all the PCPU stuff uh, in the driver is because, yes, it'll follow you. Okay. So, and um, the, like, a Nehalem or a Penrin or one of those, uh, it knows, it, it gets the counters correctly for you. Nice. Yeah, so it works on its own. Other questions? All right, thank you very much.